The follow good afternoon. The following interview was conducted with uh, Professor Lowell S. Harden for the Purdue University Library's Oral History Program. It took play place on Thursday, March the 8th, 2007, in the Ag Administration Conference Room. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon. Can you tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings for our researchers? Um, a little bit about what was your background? Well, thank you, Catherine. I was born and reared on a farm in central Indiana, near Knightstown, Indiana, which is uh, halfway between Indianapolis and Richmond, in a Quaker community. Most of our family were Quakers. They had come from North Carolina uh, back when uh, they came with horses and wagons. And uh, my father was a young, eager farmer who he and my mother both graduated from a Quaker Academy, and my father came to Purdue for our winter course. Went home, we got married, and in 1917, I came along. And uh, we were very active farm people. I have a, one brother, uh, Dr. Russell Harden, a uh, Purdue graduate, and a sister, Helen Townsend, whom you know, and uh, both of them came to Purdue as well. I guess there was never any question but that we would go to college, and there probably wasn't any question but what we would go to Purdue. Nothing, no, you could sneak in another institution. What can you tell us what date when we were born? Date November 16, 1917. And you went to high school, did you go to high school there as well? High school in Knightstown, uh, taking uh, vocational agriculture actually, as well as uh, the regular curriculum. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, the the Purdue connections continue all through. I suppose there's been a Purdue connection since I was 10 years old and got into 4-H work. Okay. And how do you uh, explain a little bit what you mean by the connection? With well, the vocational ag teacher was the Purdue graduate who, in turn, headed the 4-H work in our the township. Uh, his name was Al Sharp. And to us kids, uh, here was a fellow that graduated from Purdue, and he was on the wrestling team at Purdue. And then when we got big enough, he brought us to Purdue to 4-H conferences. And that was our first glimpse of the campus, was when this Purdue man, our teacher, brought us kids off the farm up to Purdue to Roundup Week. Tell us about what year that was. What was the campus like? And what was your, do you recall any impressions that you had when you came up? Uh, my impression was that it was big because at that time, uh, when I was probably first time up with maybe 12, 14, uh, hadn't been out of state. And uh, this was a strange place. We would stay in a rooming house so that, because we didn't have any money about things. So that was the cheapest place to stay. And we discovered these things that college students had in those rooms and the drawers. And this was eye-opening to us kids. And then they would have on campus open house and the engineering people would uh, have an evening and the physics people would have an evening. They'd do all kinds of experiments and you'd have lightning flashing and that kids would remember that. And then they made up uh, little Purdue medals over in the metal shop in, the, in mechanical engineering and they turned them out on, <laughs> on the lathe and we could have one. And these were things that were done then uh, even before, when we were practically coming by uh, train instead of by car uh, to, uh, to the campus for the first time. Yeah. Did you come by, how did you come, did you come by train? From uh, no, we, uh, I... earlier than that we had had uh, the Purdue specialists come to do extension work by the Purdue train. And John Swab and, and the folks would bring their lessons about how to raise hogs, clean sanitation systems, and and how to do your crops improvements better. And this was done in a train that moved around the state and then the exhibits were held. I was reminded of that many, many years later when I was invited out to Nebraska to do uh, a series of lectures to the Nebraska bankers. And they put a special train on and I had a roomette in this train and you would move after a meeting at night, the train would move through the night. And then the next morning you'd arrive at one of those Nebraska towns and you'd have a luncheon meeting, and then you'd have a dinner meeting, the bankers, and then after that, you'd climb back on the train and roll on to the next town. For a week, you went from town to town, and you know the Nebraska towns, 
you come up the railroad track and there's the elevator and that's it. <laughs> so I, re I remind as a kid and then as uh, years when I was a professor doing talks. This, could you explain this Purdue tra this train went around the state? Is that what? Uh, well, yes, this was how they did extension work in ah. the days. And you had, you'd have the wall posters inside the, the car and the, the car, there was many more tracks of course, around the state then uh, that uh, I was not actually involved in that, but I so remember that's seeing it. Would, that's the way they did. The extension work, they would go by train and yeah. the various towns throughout the state. Yeah, that, that was way back when. Yeah, sure. That's very good. Yeah. Then you say you came on to uh, Purdue, and did you, li you lived on campus? Tell us a little bit about campus when you were here. Well, like the, the yes, indeed. I um, came to Purdue, as I said, uh, I did in high school, I was fortunate enough to have this wonderful teacher, and we had a livestock judging team, and our livestock judging team won at the state and then the international. And that gave me a scholarship. I won a scholarship to Purdue, wonderful scholarship, paid $32 a semester, paid my fees. <laughs> and that was in 1935. Uh, so I came here and my closest friend, almost like a brother, Clifford Harden, was here two years ahead of me. And he and I reared on adjoining farms. Clifford was already an Alpha Gamma Rho fraternity. And so I just moved into the house. They invited me to move in. And I got a job serving tables. So I made my board by serving tables and working in the kitchen. That, uh, because money was very scarce. This is depression and we didn't any of us have any money. Uh, but uh, the streetcar was cost a nickel to ride the streetcar up University Street and it stopped right in front of the off-camera row house on 607 University. So it would come up there and stop and then they'd turn the thing around uh, up on top so that they could come back down. And that was fine except when the students decided they wanted to bounce it off the hill and so coming up and down. But you could ride a free nickel over to town. Uh, I thought I ought to be earning some money too, besides there. And Miss Nugent in the union advertised that she could use some folks to serve banquets if they were experienced. Well, I served a little at the African Row House, and so she paid me 25 cents an hour for serving tables. And I got along pretty well, except I had a catastrophe one night. I was serving stacked up. And then the deal was that you put the garbage from the plates on, all on the top plate and that sat on top of it and you put them on a tray and carried them out. Well, I went fine until I squeezed between the row and that top plate dumped off. And here, Ted, on the back of the chair of a woman in a red formal evening gown, it was a women, banquet for women, the garbage dumped inside the gown and the plate went off and rolled on through there. And I looked up and there in the back, to, looking right through the door from the kitchen was Miss Nugent. She motioned for me and sent a senior out in his cords to clean up behind me. Didn't let me out the kitchen after that. <laughs> <laughs> so these, uh, all these memories, they're very key in one's life, you know. You do remember. <laughs> yeah, that was good. Yeah. At any rate, it uh, seemed to me that campus, of course, we had relatively few women. Maybe it was five to one or something. Were there men. Any in, the, in the School of Agriculture at that time? Uh, there, there were hardly a, a woman was an oddity in the class of agriculture, and now then they're a majority. Uh, one of the great changes, of course, is in the gender uh, in the classrooms. Uh, the, I went at campus, the fraternity house, I was kind of green, but they decided they were going to polish me up and I should get out for activities, and so I did. In fact, uh, started on the Exponent and worked there four years and so on. But uh, many, the emphasis was very much on getting out and getting into activities as well as doing your academics. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's the same now, maybe less so, I don't know. But uh, you started out, you had a green pot for bought you as a freshman. Sophomore, if you were lucky, you became a skull and crescent and that gave you another kind of a hat. And then you got to be a gimlet if you made it to the next group and uh, a few made iron key. And there were many other I, besides Sigma Delta Chi and for the journalistic group and mm -hmm. other of the honoraries, uh, Alpha Zeta, et cetera. And so you, I picked up the yearbook of 1939 here, 
just to uh, look up how important we then felt that formal dances, uh, activities, and uh, really dressing up with a tux was socially. They don't seem to do that anymore. But then I found five dollars and bought a used tux, and I was I was really <laughs> in business. And uh, you needed that. That was nice to have. Oh my, yes, and and uh, you had oh you had the sophomore cotillion, you had the junior prom, you had the military ball, uh, you had dances where the formal dances the women invited the men. And if you got to go then, that was something. Uh, and I wasn't a dancer. We Quakers didn't dance in those days, and I had but. Um, we got the dances anyhow, went to dances. And we had, you know, the, t the time of the, of the bands that uh, you, you just think about now with the big time Wayne King, Jan Garber. We brought them here for, on campus. It was marvelous, marvelous, we big fortunate. time of the big time bands. We were fortunate, yeah. and Of course, there was, there was the academics all the way too, of course, and that was very important. Now, then, uh, you, at, when you finished, what was your career? What did you do after that? I think you went to grad school, am I correct? Well, yeah, you I see, uh, finished in 1939, and I had aspirations then to be a journalist. I had four years on the Exponent. And you were the managing editor. Managing editor of the Exponent, uh -huh. and that incidentally was, then the Exponent was quite different than now. We didn't pay anybody. Uh, we produced it over in town at Haywood's. We had a little office in the Union Building, copies there, but the work was really done over there, uh, where Haywoods is now on North Fifth Street. And it was two or three o'clock in the morning when you got everything locked into press and ready to run the first copy. So somebody had to stay, and we did everything ourselves except the linotop operators. And the activities key for the for the exponent was the linotop key, and uh, made over, of course. Then, uh, but. You got hungry about midnight, and so you go out to Jen's Silver Shanty across the street and get a hamburger for a nickel. And uh, that would carry you to one or two o'clock when you got the paper to press. But the good thing about it was that as a managing editor, we carved up whatever the earnings were among us, and I got $600 for my year's work in Did and they have ads? Did you have ads in the newspaper advertisement? Oh, yes. Oh, we, that's no. the way the paper supported itself, as it does now, sure. of course, and it makes money. But they pay the students now to work on it. We didn't have any pay. But the, we had a formula by which the officers divided up any earnings, and that paid my cost for the senior year at Purdue was that 600 bucks, well, essentially so. But then I thought I'd be a journalist, but there weren't any jobs. I interviewed one for one magazine in Chicago. But uh, that was a livestock magazine. I got a nice steak dinner out of it, but no, no job offer. So actually, the person that was my mentor in the latter part of my Purdue period, E.C. Young, Doc Young, whose Young Hall is named after him over here, one of my very favorite people. He called me in one day and said, you ought to go to graduate work. Well, they, they offered me graduate work here. No, not at Purdue. Cliff Harden's going here and getting his doctorate. And we got a doctorate program going with Earl Butts and Cliff Harden uh, going for our first folks in ag economics to get degrees, advanced degrees. But you ought to go someplace else. How about Cornell? Well, I didn't, Cornell, that's New York. That's, that's a different kind of agriculture than I know. Well, you come on them, and they offered me a job, uh, an assistantship, 60 bucks a month. So I... Got on the train and... No, I had, a, I had earned a, had a car that had cost me $300. See, and, my junior year, uh, after my junior year in college, hybrid seed corn came in, and we were producing the first fields of hybrid seed. And Keller Beeson, who ran the uh, seed certification service, which was handled out of Purdue, needed a field inspector to go out and see if the farmers were actually detasseling the corn on time so that there was no pollination. Uh, wrong pollination, of course. And so you had to detassel the, the female rose so that the male rose would pollinate the females. And he said, Lo, uh, your dad was uh, active as a corn grower, and uh, I've worked with the family all these years. Wouldn't you like to be a, our inspector? So another fellow and I were the first two inspectors for hybrid seed corn in Indiana. And he paid me three cents a mile and three dollars a day. And on that, I paid for a $300 car. 
<laughs> so I had that to drive to Ithaca when I went to, out to start graduate work. Okay. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your time at, at Cornell. Um, and, and were other Purdue people there at that time, or were you the only one? There was, next year, Don Perlberg came, my closest friend. He, uh, he decided to follow you there, huh? He, uh, well, he and I were fraternity brothers, Dolph Gamero, and uh, very good friends. And of course, he was older than I because he farmed for 10 years before he came to Purdue and came to a winter course and then was spotted and came to regular years. And he and Eva moved uh, out a year later. First year, I uh, got to Ithaca, and the next day they sent me to northern New York to do field work. And I mapped fields all summer by myself, and came back that fall and got into coursework, moved into an apartment with five other graduate students, fellows from ag economics. We cooked our own meals and lived together. And Mary, my Purdue girlfriend, Mary Cooley, uh, had a job up in Buffalo. In Niagara Lockport, Ontario. I had forgotten to tell you that back on June 5 in 1939, she took my pin one evening. And in those days, that was, since we didn't have money for an engagement ring, that was an engagement ring. That was engagement. So we, uh, she got a job up there, and then she had enough money. She made $12 and a half a week. So she had enough money, she'd take the Lackawanna Railroad down to Ithaca and visit me about once a month. But that got to be also come uh, September of 1940, we got married back here and then moved to Ithaca. So uh, then we had a problem because 60 bucks a month and how do you live on that? So we rented a farm out north of Ithaca and uh, I had a couple of cows and rented out the fields and got the feed for the cows and took the milk into town and sold it. And uh, Mary took in as a rumor a landlady and uh, the school teacher in one room schoolhouse down the road. So we made ends meet and got through graduate work. Very good. Yeah. Uh, then uh, after you finished there, what would you want to then career path to? Well, then, then. One, one thing, excuse me, one thing I want to ask you. The uh, courses, these winter courses that your father yeah. took, why don't you uh, elaborate just a little bit on that because some people that are reading the transcripts, it might help them. What we did in those days, uh, with my father, through the time that I started teaching at Purdue, I started teaching at Purdue in 1943, when I finished at Cornell. In 1944, I taught winter course of 120 students. Would this be like in January? In this January, February, eight weeks winter course. This was for farm people who didn't have the funds or the energy to go to a four-year college and had practical agricultural instruction at the college level. They were marvelous students because they were eager uh, and uh, you just go in the classroom, it was fun. But it was, that was wartime. We had, were very short staffed in 43, I'm talking about right now. We had the GIs coming back here um, and we had the V-12 program and others, then we had the GLs coming. So I was teaching college level stuff with advanced, very smart guys, and a few gals, but not very many, and the winter course. So you'd be in the classroom 20 hours or more a week sometimes then, in that period. But that's, but anyhow, it's interesting, at a football game this past fall, I had a man come up to me and he said, you had me in winter course X years ago. I want you to meet my son and my grandson. <laughs> and so I've had sons and grandsons, three generations of folks that have been in my classes. But at any rate, uh, going back to Cornell, I rather enjoyed Ithaca and the place there, but this was wartime. I had failed my physical to get into the military, it was war. And uh, there were jobs there. They offered me a job, which would pay six or seven thousand dollars. That was a lot of money then, in New York. But I really wanted to get back to agriculture in the Midwest, and I, Purdue was my hope. So Prof. Lloyd, who was head of agriculture, mommy said, "Well, we'd like to hire you, Lowell, but we can't." I said, "Well, you're short staff." He said, "Yep, yeah, but nepotism. Your father-in-law is a professor." 
Purdue does not allow us to hire relatives of relatives. The nepotism law is in effect. But good old Doc Young, my mentor, said, Lowell, I've got a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation, or the predecessor of the Rockefeller Foundation, the General Education Board, and I need somebody to direct this project. You come work for me. You won't, Purdue won't be hiring. I'll take the grant money and hire you. So I came back to Purdue in, December, in January of 1943 to work on a farm work simplification project uh, with Dr. Young, Dr. E.C. Young, and it turned out that I worked with Lillian Gilbreth and other people because it used time and motion and so forth in it. And that's how I gained access to Purdue. The next year, all these students came, went of course in everything, and Purdue changed its rules. Nepotism no longer applied, and I was brought on as assistant professor. And you were in the agricultural economics department. Agricultural economics department, right. Then you've been there, for, were there for quite a while. Can you tell us a little bit about the students and the curriculum and the connection also with your uh, extension service during your uh, time there? In, as I came back uh, to ag economics, first with Prof. Floyd, and then with Earl Butts as head of the department. You were in a department where the head of the department uh, Earl really thought it was important to get out with the public and make speeches. Each year you had to turn in to him a list of all the talks you'd made to all the audiences and where they were. So, so no matter whether you were teaching or research or what, and my one was a combination of teaching and research. And for years I took over from Doc Young the teaching of the introductory and advanced management courses. And I did some policy work and other things. But uh, I did research with graduate students, so we had graduate students, masters and PhD students working with us. Uh, had some huge classes. I would have 300 or half the war, the yes. And uh, some of the students were absolutely remarkable. Uh, even during the, while well, we're still going with Japan and we had the V12 program here, I had one class I remember in summer in management. They sat there in their military uniforms, no air conditioning in this building next to the old Ag Hall Annex over there, and upstairs. So we took off those wool jackets, took off their shirts and undershirts in the classroom, and there we sat. And two or three of persons in that class of 32 students became college presidents. It's just what talent there was. And so Back in the department, a little later, when these GIs came back, the marvelous GI bill, R.B. Stewart had a lot to do with, we just had the cream of the crop. And we could pick out of these people to add to our staff. And when we were expanding budget, particularly with marketing funds, Research and Marketing Act came through, federal, that gave Purdue some funds. That largely came to ag economics. And so by the time I became department head in 53, when Earl went to Washington, Earl Butts, we had flexible money and we could hire some of these top folks that had gone through the mill here or elsewhere and that helped build that department tremendously. Build the faculty. Oh, yes. Student, could, the student enrollment increased too? Oh, yes, the student uh -huh. enrollment came up sharply but uh, from where it was, but the increase in the university, of course, had been gradual. Uh, but we had uh, good enrollment in agriculture because for a while after the the agricultural was pretty good. And then it was later that in the department that uh, we launched the agribusiness programs and some of the really uh, spectacular changes in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I noticed in some of the reading that I did, you were very fortunate to attend that first international conference in 47. Yeah. Uh, that right after the war was over. That must have been an interesting. That was absolutely fascinating. The interesting story that, uh, of course, here I was, an instructor at Purdue, started here at $3,000 a year salary. And uh, they advertised the Farm Foundation in Chicago, said, we are going to award 10 fellowships to go to the International Conference of Ag Economists. They'll be $1,000 a piece. And you're welcome to apply for them. Well, I applied. Earl Butts applied. 
Cliff Harden applied, and we all three got it. And Doc Young went on his own. So there are four of us that went to the International Conference of Ag Economists uh, in Darlington Hall in southern England. And uh, this, the most, I even, you know, one of my first professional papers I gave, I gave at that international conference. But what struck me, and which I shall never forget, were people there from behind the Iron Curtain who listened on radio someplace every morning to know what was happening to their family left back home because they had to leave their folks there, family there, for them to come out as hostage. And they were nervous, they were thin. They were, uh, and then afterwards I went across Germany, of course, devastated Germany. After the conference you did some traveling? Uh, we, yes, we did. I uh, didn't feel I had the money, but I thought I'd never be traveling so much anymore. And I, this was our great golden opportunity. So we traveled both in England and then went over to uh, the Hook of Holland and took the train across from Germany, devastated Germany, up to the Scandinavian countries, and then from there back to France, and France back to England, back home. Uh, learned something all the way, particularly when we started to leave, and we were going, I was going to, never had traveled on sea, and so I was going to go on the USS United States travel across in style. We had books and books. We got to New York, got on board the ship, stayed there one day, stayed there two days. There was a strike. They couldn't get out of shore. And we had to go on at least a TWA tri-motor <laughs> to get to England. <laughs> and then, of course, we got there early <laughs> ahead of our reservations. But we made it. Yeah. The conference, were there people then from... The All over the world. All so yes. Asian, Asia as well? Oh, yes. Sir Leonard Elmhurst uh, was the host at his place at Darting Hall in uh, Totnes in southern England. And uh, he had been a Cornell person uh, trained in agricultural economics and uh, had married a good bit of money over here and uh, had acquired this property. And so he was active in resuscitating the International Conference after the war, which was held in abeyance. It normally had met every four years. And so there was... This was the first time in... First the time after the war, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the conference is still held every four years. Uh, and, of course, it's become a rather huge affair. It, uh, perhaps there were, well, I'd say 100, 150 people there at Totnes and Darlington mm -hmm. Hall. This is a... 1958 research project that Dr. Harden was involved in uh, was funded by the Indiana Heart Foundation and Purdue University to find out methods by which cardiac farmers can do their work and still make it easy on their hearts. Tell us a little bit about that project. Yes, so that, go that, that goes back to the first uh, project that I had at Purdue and the one uh, that Doc Young had received a grant from the precursor of the Rockefeller Foundation, the General Education Board, to support. It was wartime. We had inadequate labor to do all kinds of chores on the farm. And they called this a farm work simplification project. What it really involved was to figure out simpler ways that you could do farm work, that you could then teach non-farm people to do those things and do them effectively and without harm to themselves. The, this involved time and motion study. And Lillian Gilbreth was a visiting professor at Purdue working with the industrial engineering people and Dr. Marvin Mundell over industrial engineering. So I learned from them how to do motion and time study and then taught others in other places how to do it. So I had a, did some out in Washington for apple picking we picked tomatoes in Indiana, et cetera, and got out instructions then how to do this work so inexperienced people could easily learn from film and from the handouts. And actually, we then uh, eventually produced a book. There's a little book we called Farm Work Simplification that Wiley and Company put out that uh, told about how you simplified farm work. Well, this then taught us to the brought us to the point that we realized when we talked to doctors that there were standards of energy requirements that they knew about how you shoveled steel or worked in a steel mill, 
but the doctors did nothing about how the farm work affected the energy requirements in farming. So it was this work then that led us to studying the energy requirements of farm work for doing different kinds of tasks, different kinds of stress, etc. Interestingly enough, to get a panel of people with whom to work, uh, we advertised and sent out questionnaires, have you ever had a heart attack, and what brought it on, and so on. And at the same time we did this, President Eisenhower had a heart attack. This popularized the whole notion, and we got a marvelous response. So we identified these people, and then developed, took a house trailer, mobile house trailer, and made that a mobile laboratory. Took them to the country, and brought these people in, who were part of our sample, to this laboratory to give them physicals. We had medical students doing the physicals, and doctors reading the EKGs, etc. And we then were able to correlate the kind of energy or stress that they'd been under that brought on the heart attack or the problem. And then with the energy requirement efforts that they took doing different tasks, we could calibrate this and give information eventually to the physicians with respect to what requirements were for farm work in terms of lifting or working or, and of course the worst thing was stress. Uh, when, when everything went wrong and the horse got to straddle the barbed wire fence and the cattle got in the cornfield and the rain came down, you had to run out and do it, and then the barn door came off and you had to lift it, that's when something happened. We had, had, those, the, had the farm, the ones that in the project, had they suffered heart attack? They had, could be sort of a heart, thing. they had suffered impairment. Okay. They, okay. they were the ones that thought, had or thought they had and they were part of our sample or universe. So this, uh, I became department head while we were doing some of this and Dr. Bill Morris will, uh, came on and helped me and became the leader of the project uh, with a friend and fellow colleague in sociology uh, who brought up some of the stuff. But there was the first major Yes, it research was. project of that kind that, that we had done. Right. And then uh, while you were uh, in the, as department head, the uh, project is I, in Viscosa, Brazil, the Minas Gras. Oh, the, yes. You were sort of a consultant on that, but that was Purdue. Purdue uh, Indeed. The, you're talking about the what became the Federal University of Viscosa in Minas Gerais in Brazil. Yes, uh, we, that's an interesting story, and it's a commentary on Dean Harry Reid. The time that USAID decided that it would help support the development of land grant type colleges in developing countries, Harry Reid said Purdue would be interested and we should see about whether we could help develop a college or university in Minas Gerais in Brazil. Why Brazil? Well, he said it's the largest country in Latin America. And it wasn't completely popular with everybody, all the professors, because Dean said, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. And this means that the best people are going to have to participate. He never went to Brazil himself. But as I, would, as I was a department head, he said, Lowell, you'll pick out three or four of your very best professors, and they're, if we're going to do this, well, that's going to be what they want to do. And so I have to learn Portuguese, and we'll, we'll do this with it right. Well, it worked. Uh, I give him credit. I give the staff credit. And I worked with it closely through the years I was at Purdue. And then after I went with the Ford Foundation, in, uh, again, we granted Purdue a good bit of money to continue the work in Brazil. So that that institution that at the time we started, when I first went down there, we had, they had 200 students in this small uh, one building school. And today there are 10,000 students with graduate work and a flourishing university. Now that's the credit to the Brazilian, but they credit Purdue a great deal for this. We had over 40 professors that spoke fluent Portuguese at the time that they'd been through that training program. They learned their Portuguese mostly down there. I remember going down one day, uh, Woods Thomas, who later became the first head of international agricultural programs here at Purdue, ag economics professor, he and his family were down there. And I went down on a visit and we're sitting, he met me in Rio. And we were sitting on the porch, the veranda of a hotel on a Coco Bennett. 
and he and I were sitting there visiting and he would speak to the waiter and waitress in Portuguese and I was so impressed. And I didn't know that sitting behind him was a young woman, Lily, who was his teacher. But she'd come down from Vesosa too. And I said, Woods, I am so impressed with how good your Portuguese is. She turned to me and says, Dr. Harden, that's because you don't understand Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> School of Agriculture involved in that, or was it? A uh, this was an agricultural program. Oh, uh, yes, did indeed. Extension uh, was involved in. Oh yes, we uh, we did. People from the first person we had from Ag Economic School was Dr. Lynn Robertson, who was assistant head of the department and a very senior person in the department. He had earlier done international work in the Philippines, and I suspect he was one of the first persons that did international work uh, from our department in, in, uh, at Purdue. Uh, he had this feel for it and gone to the Philippines and helped set up the school at Los Banos in the Philippines and taught economics there. Largely this was a matter of faculty teaching there while their persons came here or elsewhere to get training to go back. So we, like an we were filling in and developing the teaching and programs and doing the teaching in these places while more of their staff, and they had over 300 people come out and get advanced degrees, many of them from Purdue, a linkage which still exists to this day on a very friendly basis. In fact, not very long ago, just three or four years ago, a uh, group of alumni from the Vasosa experience got together, went to Vasosa in Brazil, and they had a two-day symposium where their people and our people each presented papers and discussion uh, where you had a renewal of this. Ed Chu came down from Minnesota, Bob Thompson was dean then and did it, and uh, Omer Erickson, etc. I think we had maybe 20 people or so go. It was a very successful thing and just kept alive this warm relationship that exists with so many students. I've had, had many friends as a result. And Edson Potch, who was a grand hator of uh, Vesosa in those days is still living. And uh, Homer Erickson, who was down there recently to receive an honorary degree from Vesosa, brought back pictures of this elderly gentleman. Oh, nice. yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, in, your, in the Department of Ag Econ, you also featured Jim Bottom and Earl Butts and John Hicks and Dr. Powerberg. Could you share some reminiscences of your, your colleagues and uh, over time? Yes, I, I was blessed uh, as a department head to have had inherited a, a staff of wonderful people to work with, and these were great colleagues. There was, there was an interesting feeling then, unfounded in my view, that folks that were doing what we call engagement work now and extension work, they somehow felt that they were not really first-class citizens as contrasted to the researchers that got the glory of the journal papers and that type of thing. That worried me. I had, I, uh, then we had many starting to be on joint appointments. They'd have teaching and research or research and extension or maybe all three, drawing from the three. But there was this feeling that somehow the university, not the people in the state, but the university, uh, didn't really recognize them and give them the right credit. We worked very hard because it was easy. We had some simply superb minds in our extension group. J. Carroll Bottom, assistant head for our extension and department there, was, of course, one who got an honorary doctorate here, first class. J. B. Colmeyer. Uh, the man who worked behind the scenes with the Indiana State Legislature, he and Bottom, I credit with the changing and revolutionizing the educational system in the state of Indiana. We would never have had consolidated schools in Indiana had these people not done the extension work, educating, these are the pros and cons, this is what will happen, and conditioning people that eventually they gave up the basketball team in their hometown to have a consolidation. This, this was a tremendous contribution to the state. Uh, I could, and in the management, in the development, uh, another would be Noah Hadley. And I can go on through folks that are now 
we just were blessed with having these able people who brought home the bacon to Purdue too, because across the state, they were the names of the persons that were really recognized and appreciated. Well, we were able to get full professorships for these people, even if they didn't all have PhDs. They didn't, but they got full professorships because they moved through the ranks and this merit was recognized. And so I hope that that's one of the things that we achieved in our mm -hmm. department that, that made me feel very good. Mm -hmm. Then the department brought along people of uh, great talent. For example, one of our graduate students, uh, as I think of people that made contributions to Purdue, was John Hicks. And he was a man behind the scenes with Hubdi and during all those years. He was a teacher in our department. We brought him in, Earl, interviewed him out, Earl Butts did, when he was a uh, student at Connecticut and uh, stores and he, no, it was Amherst, Massachusetts, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And uh, came here, I remember the day he came in, GI shoes and a sweatshirt. <laughs> he and Swifty. Swifty would be a great one for you to interview sometime. Yeah, that's right. I remember meeting John. That, that, uh, that's now we move. You're the senior anchor coach. Let's talk a little bit about some of your, one of the quotes in, in your book, you say that in an institution of development work is hard, demanding work. And here's a graduate of a land grant institution and you made, you did all kinds of things with the Ford Foundation. And uh, you work with the centers and things of that sort. Yeah. Uh, challenges. One of the things. And opportunities at the same time. Huh? Yeah. This is. Well, I didn't ever apply for a job anytime except when I was a graduate student at Cornell, and they said, "Well, we have a winter course here, and we might let a graduate student teach it." And I applied for that job and got it. So that was my first teaching job. But other than that, other jobs came along as did the one at Purdue. And one day I was uh, sitting over here in the office and got a call from the Ford Foundation. And uh, I was head of the department then. I'd had some little international work. I had surprised Earl Butts one time and said I, when he asked, uh, would somebody like to make a study in Japan of market development? somebody in our department, and I wrote a book back, yes, Lowell Hardin would, and shocked him, but I took leave for three months and went to Japan and made that study. And I'd done some other international work on the side, and I was interested in it. But anyhow, got a call from the Ford Foundation, said, uh, we're setting up an agricultural program in Latin America, and you've been recommended to come and work with us for a year. Well, that excited me. And I don't know, it shows how informal we were in those days. I picked up the phone and phoned Fred Hubdy. And I said, Fred, uh, I've got this offer from Ford. Would it be okay? Oh, sure, if you, we'll work it out. Uh, they'd like for Purdue to second me to them for a year. Okay, we'll work it out. I don't know why I didn't go to Butts first or something, but I did. And uh, we worked it out and Purdue seconded me. Ford paid my salary to Purdue and Purdue paid me and I stayed on Purdue for a year. But two-thirds of the way through the year, they said, you know, this job isn't done. Why don't you just hang around a while? We make year-to-year -year appointments. We don't have any tenure. Well, that took some thinking. Tenured professorship back here and all kinds of things, family. Promised the kids we'd go for a year. This was a one-year job. Department head? Yeah, I was on leave from the department. And and uh, other jobs at Purdue were in the offing. But we discussed it a while and Mary really encouraged me. She said, this will stretch you and, and uh, why don't you stay? So we wrote to Earl Butts our letter of resignation and said, we'll start with staying with the Ford Foundation. And that one year turned into 17. And it was these were very, very exciting years because we were on the cusp of widespread starvation, particularly in Asia. Then we were shipping something like two shiploads of wheat a day just to keep people alive in India. And the foundations 
working with the Rockefeller Foundation, said, well, well, this won't help. We've got to get to the reason behind it. We've got to enable these people to produce more food themselves. And the upshot was the creation of international agricultural research stations, first in the Philippines, then in Mexico. And eventually we had 17 of them scattered around the world in a global network covering the major food commodities where international staffs under international boards of directors were, su were supported to do research and training primarily in plant and animal production in sustainable methods that would increase the available food supply, increase incomes to poor people, and make life more pleasant and healthy. Well, it worked. This, uh, this is, I'm sorry. Take it off, unplug it. Well, we were talking about the International Agricultural Research Centers that were started by the Rockefeller and Ford Foundations. And it was my good fortune to be in on the ground floor and to uh, help set those up and to serve on the boards of directors of them around the world and to see them actually be instrumental in bringing back the Green Revolution, which saved the lives of millions of people. Can I ask you to, um, for the researchers, could you give us just when you, how these centers would be set up, how you work with the local... Yes. Uh, what we did was, in partnership with the host country, I'll take Philippines, for example. We went to the Philippines, talked to the government of the Philippines, and said, rice is a key food crop for the people in Asia. We think that if we applied modern science and technology research to the production of rice, that we could enhance the productivity of the crop. We will need a research station with laboratories and places to work in the field actually growing rice to do this. We will have to bring together an international staff and have laboratories and so forth. They said, we will provide the land. The Ford Foundation said, we will put up the money uh, for building the, this research station, not, like, not unlike experiment station here in the United States with research bot. We we'll say we'll need 500 hectares of land. It'll have to be irrigated. We'll have to have a water supply. We'll have to be all these things. we we'll have to build the buildings, to have the labs. And the Rockefeller Foundation said we will help put the staff together. So the initial staff was put together under the direction of Robert Chandler, in that case, who was a Rockefeller career person, and Sterling Wartman, and they went through Asia and found various people and developed an international staff. One of those staff persons was, he happened to be here at Purdue, and his name was Peter Jennings, and he was just finishing his graduate work in plant pathology, and he came into Dean Young's office one day and said to Dean, Dean says, Pete, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to have to work on wheat draft up in North Dakota for USDA. That's not very exciting. A lot of people have done it. He said, just a minute, Pete. And he called George Harrar and the Rockefeller Foundation. He said, I'd like to talk to this fellow. George says, Pete, I understand you're a good plant breeder. Oh, okay. He said, what do you know about rice? Don't know anything. I'm going to send you down to Louisiana. You take a look at rice and see whether you'd like to go. Well, Pete became a founding member of the staff of the Rice Research Institute in India, in the Philippines. He was a co-developer of, uh, six years later, IR8, which was a semi-dwarf rice that would, you could apply fertilizer to, it wouldn't grow up and fall down because it had a stiff straw, and it doubled and tripled production per acre. That spread, people called it a miracle rice, but it wasn't a miracle. It was a result of science and technology applied to the problem. And this along with the wheat that Norman Borlaug developed at Simmet, the other, the sister station, research station, and he and colleagues there, and took to India and Pakistan, and I'm just writing up the history of how this came about. Uh, this uh, resulted 
in wheat and rice multiplied production. Countries that were in food deficit became, in seven years, food surplus. Not that everybody was fed, because there were still poor people who couldn't get to it. But there was they no longer had to have food aid come in from the outside. This is one of the institutional and research and scientific developments that uh, I think is one of the outstanding things that occurred in the 20th century. And today, if you look at uh, The Economist as of today, you'll see that the new foundation effort in Africa is to create a new green revolution for Africa where it has not reached. And the Gates and Rockefeller Foundation are partnering to pull it off. Mm -hmm. And that's today's news story for philanthropy. Um, in, this, uh, this, in the centers, you, uh, Ford took care of the staffing. Are the centers... The staff was, uh, was Rockefeller, the, the first center was largely, key people were from Rockefeller. Because they already had career people, more than Ford, that were already working. For already working had worked in Mexico program that had preceded it. Ford had had a program and extension in India. Hadn't been too successful, spent millions on it. But we didn't have the right kind of technology for the extension people to extend. And because we didn't have it until the Green Revolution material came along, it wasn't too successful. So we learned a hard lesson that I've carried all for life, that extension is great. But you've got to have something, they carry the gun, but if you don't have ammunition to put in it, you're powerless. And to go out and extend without having the research behind you that can take new technology, new policies, proven ideas that can, you know, have a good chance of going and be accepted, you, extension is not, it's up to say. So that's how, now the two foundations actually developed the first four centers. The one in the Philippines was rice, the one in Mexico was corn and wheat, the one in Nigeria was tropical crops, particularly a replacement for the old slice and burn system when we had cassava, and the one in Colombia was on Colombian tropical crops. So the two foundations developed the first four. These got going, did so well, particularly the first two, that the foundation said, we can't really go ahead with further. We've got to have more money. And John Hanna, who was formerly president of Michigan State, was then the director of USAID. And we said to John, you know, what will USAID do? John said, how would it be if for every dollar we put up, the rest of the world would put up $4 for these centers? And that's how we got the additional ones funded, was the... Europe came in, Canada came in, and today what started out with a very modest few thousand dollars is now a $500 million a year budget to run these centers, raised from 50 institutions, including all the industrial countries of the world and many of the developing countries. It's, it is not appreciated by everybody that, uh, particularly the Greens, uh, think that uh, to use chemical fertilizers and irrigation and, and genetic modification is sinful. And uh, they're persuading folks that this is it, while they let others starve because we got to apply it. It's, it's a conundrum today. I, I feel very strongly on this issue, very, very strongly. Yeah. You addressed the Green Revolution, and I know if you expand a little bit on that particular term for people who will be reading the tape, what exactly did that continue? Well, really, the and Green Revolution occurred in the United States long ago. We brought about new science and technology through our experiment stations, our research, the land grant colleges, and extension work. And farmers, together with industry, providing the inputs, brought about the whole transformation in American agriculture. That took place before and hadn't happened yet in Asia. And it took very careful work to develop plant varieties that were fitted to the agroecology of each of these particular environments. So it took local adaptive research as well as plant breeding. It took cultural practices. If you put on irrigation, when do you put it on? How much do you put it on? How do you apply it? Do you put fertilizer on? What's the right amount? 
How's, what's economic? And then if you've got the crop, can you market it? We you support the prices? If you get a flood, prices will drop, farmers will destroy it. So it's got a whole system. We call it a package approach to increasing production, productivity, and accompanying living standards and welfare of the people. This is human nutrition. And we're, we were, the people of Asia, the farmers did it, and they were successful. South and Southeast Asia. And they're still being successful today. It's going forward. And they've got their own programs. It hasn't happened yet in Africa. It must. Because there, the per capita food supply is actually declining instead of increasing. And we just haven't put the research resources in there and helped them do it enough to get them going. To so It's tougher. Not much irrigation. Not much control. Lots of dry weather. Many, many small farms. Women are doing it. Women are not educated enough, haven't had opportunity for education. I could go on for a whole litany. But this is why Purdue is involved today in international work. I go back to when we started in Vasosa and established Purdue's great reputation of being able to help institutions grow and develop and mature. We were successful in that. That gave Purdue a reputation in the international arena. We've developed then with Woods Thomas coming back from the Brazil program, started the international programs in agriculture, and that's where I found my nest when I came back to Purdue from retiring uh, from Ford. Mm -hmm. I uh, stayed there 17 years, uh, retired, and they offered me uh, an emeritus professor place because I'd been an adjunct professor while I was out there. So I came back, and that was in 1981. So since 81, I've been an adjunct professor and uh, officed uh, with both ag economics for a while and then with international programs in agriculture. You talked earlier about your book on the farmland simplification. In view of the fact that the library has that Frank and Lillian Gilbreth collection, yes. um, and you did, you indicated that you did interact, could you just make a couple of observations? Probably, I'm sure you're aware that one of her daughters just recently yes. passed away and she yes. visited. I never met Ernestine, but she made several visits to, to Purdue. And I know people that knew Lillian when she was here. Yes, uh, it was a privilege. She was very enthusiastic about this uh, application, post-war time, war time, uh, of the scientific method that she and her husband, Frank, had developed. Mm -hmm. And she was, of course, at that time, the person who was a principal promoter. Uh, she uh, interacted with students, uh, faculty, uh, cheerful, wonderful woman. And uh, I, uh, in the foreword of the book that E.C. Young wrote, that, he right? paid special tribute to her. Uh, for the contributions she made to this, right, yeah. yes, and uh, of course we, she followed the work, uh, even though she was not always on campus when she's in and out of campus right. as a visiting professor. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the things that, that you've been involved in, or, or you list as a trustee, such as for the International Center for Corn and Wheat, what does the role of a trustee? Okay, okay. what we did in setting in creating the first of these international centers, I say we, the foundations. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, was to create a, an international corporation, not-for-profit corporation, in that country under its bylaws. And this provided for the creation of an international board of directors or board of trustees. That board of trustees was half from the industrial world and half from the developing world. And they were carefully chosen to represent the different aspects of the kinds of work you'd be doing. There would be scientists of soils and plants and animals, if those were involved, economists, uh, government people, policy people. And these people then would hire the director general for the research station, for the International Center. That director general then reported to the board of trustees and was there for them to set do the governance and he to do the implementation. So you hired, the, as a member of the board, we were responsible for hiring the director general, that was the most important job, for determining and setting policy, for determining and setting policy with respect to program, and for reviewing and planning the budget. So in the early days, I helped draft the budget for CIMIT, for example. I would go down there in Mexico from New York and it was just getting started. 
And the director general was a Ed Wellhausen, wonderful guy, corn breeder, but he never handled money, budgets, and so forth. So I would go down and help him and prepare his budget. And then he would present the budget to me and the rest of the trustees when I got back down on the next trip. And then we'd take the budget to the funding agencies to see, and that was this too, that was Ford and Rockefeller, uh, to get the money to run. And that was how it worked. Of course, later, but now, uh, when we got larger and working with one of the interesting things that I learned was that if you can really show high percentage rates of return on your investment, you can get donors to put a lot of money in. And so as we were trying to go beyond the four centers to have more centers and needed them, we called the Rockefeller people, allowed us to have a major conference at Bellagio, at Villa Cerebelloni in uh, Italy. Uh, this is really a fantastic uh, center uh, that they have for conferences and so forth. And we brought together the high princes really around the world of development business and, and uh, brought in Bob Chandler from Erie, the Rice Research Institute, and the rest of us. And we showed them that we were getting at that time 50% return on our investment in this research, sometimes higher than that. Well, Bob McNamara said, you know, he was president of the World Bank then. He says, if you guys can get this kind of returns, I'll help you find the money. And two later, years later, in 1971, he and the rest of us were able to set up what we called the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research, CGIAR. Membership in this were the people that were willing to put money into these international centers. And that's how the budget grew from the small amount to over $500 million a year today to run these 15 centers around the world at the present time. And it's coordinated and worked through the Consulting Group for International Agricultural Research, which is headquartered in the World Bank in Washington. The foundations have relatively little to do anymore. They acted like foundations do, namely that they're catalytic, they start something. If it works, then somebody else picks up the funding and goes on. Now Rockefeller has stayed with and is coming back into it now uh, with the Gates Foundation in this remarkable new development of a possible uh, thrust to create a new green revolution in Africa. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks. Now you, re uh, you addressed this earlier, but now that you're back, came back in '81 and you're an assistant director in international programs, you've been pretty much involved in that, haven't you? Uh, well, yeah. This is a voluntary job. Uh, to be, how did I support myself when I came back after I retired? Well, over some of the either that or some of the activities that uh, uh, yeah. you were engaged in. Well, what I one of the things I discovered when I came back <clears throat> was that uh, there were these marvelous seminars that were held in each of the departments, and they went deeper and deeper into the subject matter they were interested in, the kind of thing that takes for promotion and so forth in your discipline, but they weren't talking to one another. So I ventured forth and set up a program of uh, seminars in international agriculture, and I didn't know who was going to come. I said, anybody come I want to. And I'll do some of the topics on international agriculture, and, and I'll call on the capital that I've got these friends around the world. And when they're coming to the United States, see if they won't stop off Chicago and fly down here or come to Indianapolis, come up here, and meet with us for seminars. And you know, that worked. I started that in 82, 1982, and it's still running today. But most of it has moved now back to the department level. But they're having the international seminars there. But we did this maybe every two weeks every month, uh, over all those years. And this is how I got to know the faculty here. I got into their labs, they'd tell me what they're doing, show them, well, how about a seminar on this and how about that? And we'll share it with the other departments and see how this interacts. And I just had a great time. I got to know these bright guys that are our faculty members and uh, they, now and then when I, help them get on a trip abroad and help them take this and work with a student there. Then they'd come back and tell me about it. And, and uh, vicariously, I lived their research again through what they're doing. And I still do today. Yeah. I had lunch with Barry Murdoch yesterday, telling me about so where we are. He briefs me on these areas that, that I'm not scientific scientist enough to understand, but I can sure get enthusiastic about what he's doing. <laughs> uh, one of the... Um I know on your CV, you've got a couple of awards, but one of the couple ones that uh, sort of caught my eye. 
when you found out about the Sagamore, how did you learn about that? Was that somewhat of a surprise? Or? It was a complete surprise. Uh, it was when we had uh, I don't know, homecoming or had a tent out here, right out here in front of Ag Hall. And uh, I went over, and I thought it kind of strange when we went to this, this ag breakfast, homecoming, two or three hundred people there. And I thought it kind of strange. My brother showed up and my sister showed up. And they didn't necessarily come that early in the morning on campus. And Mary was eager that I get over there on time. And so I was sitting back there, and then they called me up, and here came the lieutenant governor and presented me the Sagmore. <laughs> that's very, that's wonderful. Yeah. And it's uh, nice that you got that honorary doctorate. That, that's very nice. Oh, that, that, uh, I guess that I told Steve Beering when I got his letter, it was so unexpected, and last I never dreamed about, that a tear rolled down my cheek and I told him about it. It was just plain, yeah. uh, that, uh, and you see, when, when you don't, I didn't uh, achieve great scientific things and didn't write great prize-winning papers. And when somehow, out of the blue, my colleagues in ag economics made me a fellow of the American Ag Economics Association, that was a total surprise. Because usually those go, those that do the prize-winning, get more citations for their journal papers and so forth. And I didn't ever do this much. Well, I had a few papers, you know, I could claim a book or so, but I was mostly involved in organizing and managing and, and helping and get and developing staff and not really running each all this research. Each research. has a different mark and they make it and you get on target and that's uh, accepted and recognized, well, I think. I, I'm sure that my greatest satisfaction has come from what aside from family, uh, from what these folks that we've worked with have done. And, and I had, you know, I had some 32 people on my team in the Ford Foundation when we were doing all this work around the world in ag development. And then Ford Foundation went out of agriculture, and that's one of the reasons I left. Uh, but I looked where those people went. They went to college presidents. They went to all kinds of marvelous jobs. They were so talented. They came along. They learned so much. They were eager and able before. They grew some more in the job. And then they landed in all kinds of key places. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so proud of them. Yeah. And that comes along with some of the mentoring that, you, that you've done and also your special mentors. Oh, yes. So, yeah. And mentoring is really key. The key at these. Yeah, I've had. People forget to forget about that. I think it's really. Oh, no. I, I don't forget Doc Young. Yeah. And I worked, uh, and I owe a lot to Earl Butts, not necessarily alone as a mentor, but he was to, when I was in his department, and he had this great speaking ability and many, many talks. And he'd say, Lowell, you go take this talk. And tell these people, well, they call, I can't do it, but why don't you call Lowell Hart? And he'd do it. So I got the reputation of being the poor man's butts. <laughs> they could get me cheaper. <laughs> of course, you served under several presidents because when you were first, it would have been Elliot. Oh, yes, I. And uh, then Humpy and Hanson. Yes, I. One or two things I'd like to observe here. Mm -hmm. uh, Elliot and the board at that time did a rather phenomenally brave thing when they went all out to build the Hall of Music which would seat 6,000 people when it would seat the whole student body. Can you think of that? When you think of that? And this was a very brave thing to do. During the war? During the, at the it was after the war. It was a depression. It was a depression. There wasn't money. 30, the and the, and the, you can imagine, in the state, I remember the way they were criticizing President Elliott. You know, you're taking all that tainted money, all that money that came so from WP. Well, he envisioned it, and he he had to, he saw what might come ahead, and so they said, "Do you mean you, or Purdue, are taking all that tainted money from FDR? Does that kind of work project administration, WPA money, and the borrowing work?" And he turned to them and says, "Take no such thing as tainted money. Just tainted enough." <laughs> he was a great speaker, <laughs> but I thought that was it. I and I want to say another thing here. 
about those days, extension was seen as really important out in the state, maybe not so on the campus. And as the private sector came in more and more doing extension work, and farms became larger, and the farmers and agri people came directly to the researchers, maybe bypassing the county agent, there was a period in which people began to wonder, is there really a place for extension work in our nine rent colleges? And some phased it out and it became a backdoor. But you know, if you will look at what's happened under Jiski and there's Dave Petritz and really what was started before him with Hank Wadsworth as director of extension, we have seen that as the ability to engage this people of the state in the whole development issue. And we have brought to a new level of appreciation those offices and staffs in each of the 52 counties of the state. And I think that is a remarkable, important development in terms of bringing our state forward in its growth and potential. Some general reminiscences and sort of the balls of your court. Well, of course, uh, the. Uh, uh, which you shared many, but. Uh, yeah, well, of course, uh, Mary's accepting my pin and becoming my wife. And here we are, <coughs> 67 years. Uh, that, that has to be first in the family, uh, the children, and their support. And the fact that. Uh, that Mary put up with my being overseas a third of the time or so all those years in New York. And uh, this hasn't been easy for her, for them. Uh, that's, and I suppose that uh, the other most exciting thing has been to have been a part of the institutional innovation we call the International Agricultural Research Centers. One had hoped that the national programs would grow in strength and they would not longer be needed, but they still are needed today. They are. Uh, so that have been an institutional innovation that in the eyes of some will go down as important institutional innovations of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that, that's kind of exciting yeah. to have had a, a ringside seat. So I say that I was just plain lucky to be a part of the golden era of international agricultural research and development when all of this came about and so many lives were enhanced and I hope in the future more lives will be enhanced from applying some of the lessons we think we've learned from that. Any, quote, any other comment or just a general summary or anything special? Well, it's been a pleasure to, to have been associated with Purdue University uh, for now, uh, some, in one way or another, for 80 years. Uh, starting with 4-H work and uh, the link to Purdue through extension then and then on campus and my career really being in three parts. Uh, the After graduate work, there was a period here at Purdue uh, with a professor and teaching and involved with students. Students come even now and say, do you remember me? I sat in so-and-so in class. That's wonderful. And then the period uh, with the Ford Foundation and international work in New York, uh, which I could tie back to Purdue because I used Purdue people as resources for things that I needed and helped. We gave grants to Purdue and Purdue helped us. And Cornell did. I used the two institutions as resource bases because I didn't have staff enough on all the things that we needed help on. So we could call on these places. So I kept alive and I'd come back and spend time on campus every year uh, through those years. And then the third phase uh, was back here. And that started in 1981 when I retired from Ford and supported myself uh, in my volunteer work at Purdue by doing international consulting work from a base here and out of my house and kept alive my international contacts. And now Purdue allows me an office uh, in international programs, I don't do much. It's kind of an honorific thing. Talk with some people, do the seminars. But uh, I've got the computer down there, and that links me into these people and places around the world. Yesterday, I talked 
for 30 minutes with Dr. Norman Borlaug, Nobel Prize winner, a good friend who is in the hospital uh, with uh, therapy for cancer, age 93, with whom I've had the privilege of working over these years. And I called him because, unfortunately, his wife died this week and she was in the hospital room down the road. But here is a man who is called the father of the Green Revolution, the one man that's done most. And I have had the privilege of following him around the world at various places uh, and working with him as his program unfolded successfully in Asia and still some distance yet to go in Africa. So these are, these are fond memories. And these people, our children then, were able to grow up in a household in which international visitors came and went. They were accustomed to other languages, other cultures, other people. Uh, and so they, it's, it's just natural for them. And Mary, my wife, would host them and knows them and knows the families. So these have been extraordinary. It's an extraordinary opportunity that agriculture and Purdue have given me. I've never happened if uh, I hadn't happened to have gone on to graduate work and come back to Purdue and and uh, Purdue decided to yeah, could do some international work and I, that appealed to me and I got a chance to try it. Thank you very much. And this concludes the interview. Thank you, Dr. Harden. We really enjoyed it. <laughs> My pleasure. Well, we <laughs> talked too much about me and not oh, enough no. about Purdue. <laughs>